My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. I am delighted and grateful for this opportunity to speak uh, in this series of lectures sponsored by the Indian Council of Philosophical Research to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Sri Aurobindo. Not only am I delighted and grateful, but also humbled because uh, those who have delivered the previous lectures in the series were scholars like uh, Dr. Makarand Paranjpe and Dr. Devdeep Ganguly. And uh, therefore, uh, I feel it a great honor to be considered worthy of uh, speaking in the same series. Let me start with uh, not Sri Aurobindo, but uh, with my apologies, with George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw said that patriotism is the conviction that my country is superior to all the other countries because I was born in it. Now, this sort of gives the impression that uh, although in fact all countries are alike, I consider my country to be superior to all the others and that's what is responsible for this patriotic feeling and the only reason why I consider my country to be superior to all others is that I was born in it. But uh, that was not the case with Sri Aurobindo's idea of patriotism and nationalism. To him, the motherland, the country in which he was born, was not just a piece of land somewhere on this globe, where as an accident of birth, he happened to arrive. To him, it was truly the mother and uh, therefore, as a son, when he found that his uh, mother was in chains, he felt it was his moral duty, spiritual duty, sacred duty to emancipate it from those chains. And that is what made him join the freedom struggle. But then he also knew that uh, this country is genuinely superior to all others. And uh, it's not because he was born there that he thinks so because this country had been doing and had to do something for the rest of the world in the very near future. And uh, what that uniqueness of this country is, what is it that this country offers to the world, has been offering for millennia and will continue to offer for a long time to come, that we shall see shortly. But then uh, he was uh, convinced about it, he knew it, and he knew what it was in this country that uh, the rest of the world needs. And that is why he loved this country. So the reasons for loving this country for Sri Aurobindo went beyond the personal reason of just being born here. And uh, one might say that still there might be uh, some bias involved in this type of uh, impression that he had. Recently, Michael Miovic a psychiatrist uh, at Harvard Medical School, and more than that, a disciple of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, he said in one of the talks, which is there on YouTube, uh, yeah, in which he said that uh, when you fly from the West towards India, and he keeps coming to India quite frequently, uh, when you travel, when the airplane is in the Indian airspace, you feel a change in the atmosphere. You feel a certain peace descending on you. That is the type of peace that descended on Sri Aurobindo when he arrived at the Bombay port in 1893. And that is the type of change in atmosphere that the mother felt when her ship was approaching Pondicherry several miles away in 1914. And uh, relevant to what I have spoken so far is uh, a quote from Sri Aurobindo, which has been quoted by Dr. Karan Singh in his book, Prophet of Indian Nationalism, a concise but beautiful book on this subject. And uh, this is what Sri Aurobindo wrote in the Bande Matram on the 1st of December, 1907. Are we going to sacrifice our national destiny to the whims and interests of the foreigner or are we again to take ourselves seriously and struggle for the right to live that we may fulfill in this world our heaven-appointed mission? So you can see at once there is a link 
between uh, the necessity to get freedom and what we could do for the world. He wanted to wake up the country and tell them we, it is uh, important that we wake up, take ourselves seriously. That is, realize who we truly are and struggle for the right to live that we may fulfill. Which means that live in such a way that we can fulfill our role. Which role? In the world, fulfill in the world our heaven appointed mission. That is something that has been assigned to us by the divine to fulfill that mission. It's important that we first get freedom for this country. So that was the type of uh, nationalism that he had in mind. And for this it was important that uh, the goal of freedom be not half-hearted. In the sense that uh, the colonial powers had so hypnotized the world that uh, colonies had come to believe that uh, it will be almost impossible to throw them out. And uh, therefore, in India too, before Sri Aurobindo arrived on the scene, the freedom struggle, if you may call it a struggle, was limited to a sort of an intellectual pastime for the educated elite who kept pleading and praying and protesting in order to get some small concessions from the British and uh, to get total freedom was something considered impossible, impractical, unrealistic and therefore unthinkable. But then, Sri Aurobindo said that that will not do, that will not help India fulfill its mission in the world and uh, therefore what we need is total freedom, Purna Swaraj. And uh, in the short period that he was with the freedom struggle, he gave a blueprint which uh, by now is well known, uh, the doctrine of passive resistance or a boycott which means without breaking any important rules, at least any important rules, if not rules at all, without really breaking any rules, you make it difficult as well as unprofitable for the British to govern us. For example, if you stop buying things which are made in England or made anywhere abroad for that matter, then uh, you hit them where it hits most because basically the colonies were here, those countries had colonized us, uh, because uh, of two reasons, to impoverish us, to make profit from here and secondly, to achieve some sort of a uniformity of culture to impose their, by imposing their culture on the lands which they had colonized. So that was their basic purpose. So if we go in for an economic boycott, stop thing, buying things which they have made, then that will make it unprofitable for them and then we could also refuse to cooperate in many other ways by refusing to go to their educational institutions, having educational institutions which uh, will keep our own culture alive and uh, by not going to the judicial courts that they have set up, instead depend upon our own local mechanisms for getting justice which are far more efficient and less expensive and uh, if they impose any unfair taxes on us, we just refuse to pay them no matter what penalty is involved. And the last important part of this boycott was social boycott. That is, the Indians boycott those Indians who refuse to participate in the other types of boycott. Which means if some people continue to buy things which are made in England, then their neighbors and their friends and their family, they boycott them by not inviting them to their place, by not responding to their invitations, by not having their children married in those families. So this is the sort of blueprint he gave. And uh, this with some modifications, this uh, idea of passive resistance with some modifications was then later used by Mahatma Gandhi for the freedom struggle. So within this short period, he ended up making a great contribution to the freedom struggle, gave the blueprint for how full freedom could be achieved. So the goal was established and uh, goal of full freedom, Purna Swaraj, no half-hearted compromises and no sat no, not getting satisfied with mere concessions and uh, 
Secondly, how it can be achieved? Because uh, to fight with the arms was certainly unrealistic. But at the same time, there were other ways of making it difficult and unprofitable for the British to govern us. Now the country had to be emancipated. Emancipated from what? Of course, foreign rule. That is important. But there were other types of emancipation which were also required in which Yorubindo made a very significant contribution. The country had to be emancipated from an inferiority complex. Because the British had very successfully uh, made us feel that they are superior to us, we have a lot to learn from them, that they had been sent here by, by God so that they could civilize us and so on. This is the type of ideas that they had and some of them sincerely believed in it. And uh, by introducing their system of education, they had succeeded in making us also believe so. And uh, what Sri Aurobindo wanted to do was to take away this inferiority complex, wake up this country so that it would realize what it truly is. This was also what Swami Vivekananda said, awake and stop not till the goal is reached. And uh, this is what uh, essentially Rabindranath Tagore also said in that well-known poem, uh, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. Into that heaven of freedom let my country awake. Then the country had to be emancipated from dead habits and conventions. We had somehow come to see a dichotomy between worldly life and spiritual life and the result was that for the common man who was living an ordinary worldly life, a householder's life, spirituality had come to be restricted to a few rituals and ceremonies which were particularly observed on special occasions like birth, marriage and death. The rest was all optional. It was considered that uh, we have no time for spirituality. Spirituality and worldly life are poles apart. And uh, we had settled down for some rigid conventions which were meaningless because nobody even understood what the significance of those conventions was. And uh, the true spirit of spirituality had been expelled from ordinary life and this is what in fact had led to the degeneration of worldly life which in turn led to slavery which in turn further hardened this type of an attitude because when a country is enslaved then the first way one the society feels it can assert its uh, uh, identity is by sticking to its conventions so that that becomes their identity. This is what we do and this is what those who rule us don't do and therefore this makes us different. So that becomes their way of uh, asserting their identity. So that is what had to be done and this again Rabindranath Tagore also says in poetic language that when the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, into that heaven of freedom, my father let my country awake my father, refers to the divine, which means that uh, somehow this uh, idea of the divine or God entering into all spheres of life is something which is very native to this country. He was uh, talking about uh, coming out of these uh, dead habits and uh, moving towards the clear stream of reason. But then for this, whom was uh, Rabindranath Tagore praying to? God, my father. And uh, if one looks at uh, Sri Aurobindo's uh, Foundations of Indian Culture, the one thing that emerges from that book is that spirituality is uh, the core of the Indian culture and uh, that it permeates every aspect of life. Literature, art, music, dance, drama and uh, even politics and economics. It enters every aspect of Indian life. And uh, this is something which survived even slavery, could not be weeded out completely. It could be sent to sleep, but it did not die. And therefore, when Sri Aurobindo talked about nationalism being a religion, he was only 
echoing this aspect of the Indian culture. And uh, he brought in a spiritual approach to politics and considered nationalism to be a religion because to him, the motherland was a mother who had to be emancipated and uh, therefore he looked upon the motherland as a goddess and that's how religion came in. And uh, this was a sort of a spiritual approach to politics which uh, appealed to the people in the country because that was the core of this country's culture. And therefore it made a strong appeal and converted this movement, freedom movement, which was earlier restricted to the educated elite, a minority, it became a mass movement. So he succeeded in making it a mass movement and that was a, a very important contribution, again, because uh, apart from the blueprint that he gave, freedom could not come unless the masses participated in the movement and this participation of masses became possible because it went to the core of the Indian culture, it appealed to the people and since the majority happened to be Hindus, it appealed to the Hindus more than the others, but that does not mean that uh, his nationalism was exclusive. It was an all-inclusive nationalism, but then it, the, since the majority of the population happened to be Hindus and he brought in this uh, spiritual approach to uh, the freedom struggle, the people to whom it appealed the most happened to be Hindus. But that was incidental, but uh, in fact his uh, nationalism was not uh, exclusive, it was an in all-inclusive nationalism, which we shall see again in a moment uh, from what he himself said. So firstly, I mean here, the freedom movement could not be anything but spiritual in nature because that was the core of the Indian culture, it permeated every aspect of life, it had to permeate also the freedom struggle, that was inevitable. And uh, in fact, if you find that this is what continued and helped Mahatma Gandhi also when he entered the freedom struggle. Uh, the mass move, bringing in the masses had already been done by Sri Aurobindo and the spiritual approach had been introduced which Mahatma Gandhi continued. He also had a spiritual approach to the freedom struggle and he also involved the masses. And without these two elements, one which is the, at the core of the Indian culture and second, without this mass participation, in nowhere in the world can freedom be achieved. The masses have to participate and that's what happened because of this approach which went to the very heart of the Indian culture. And therefore Sri Aurobindo calls, uh, calls uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo's nationalism spiritual nationalism. And this is a conviction, uh, Dr. Karan Singh says, uh, we, this is a conviction which Sri Aurobindo held passionately and expressed eloquently. Now the all-inclusive character of uh, his nationalism, Sri Aurobindo's nationalism, again comes out uh, through uh, this passage, which is from the Bande Mataram of uh, the 22nd of December 1907. Nationalism depends for its success on the awakening and organizing of the whole strength of the nation, it is therefore vitally important for nationalism that the politically backward classes should be awakened and brought into the current of political life. The great mass of orthodox Hinduism, which was hardly ever touched by the old Congress movement, the great slumbering mass of Islam, which has remained politically inert throughout the last century, the shopkeepers, the artisan class, the immense body of uh, illiterate and ignorant peasantry, the submerged classes, even the wild tribes and races still outside the pale of Hindu civilization, nationalism can afford to neglect and omit none. So you can see his thought of all sections of the Indian population. And he says the nationalism depends for its success on the awakening and organizing of the whole nation and the whole strength of the nation, which means not only the nation should be awake, the nation should realize its strength, the strength which has uh, gone into some sort of a slumber, it has to be revitalized. And therefore it is vitally important for nationalism that the politically backward classes should be awakened. So those who have been deprived and depressed so far, it's particularly important that they be awakened and brought into the current of political life. The great mass of orthodox Hinduism, which has hardly 
which was hardly ever touched by the old Congress movement because that was confined to the westernized, western educated elite, which was a very small part of the population. The rest of the uh, country was still a great mass of orthodox Hinduism, which again was not something which was very much in keeping with the, the type of Hinduism that Sri Aurobindo uh, wanted to bring in because as Sri Aurobindo said, there are two types of Hinduism, one which is uh, rooted in Vedanta and which is essentially spirituality, which is much older and will endure longer. The other type of Hinduism was an aberration, a temporary aberration during the degenerate phase of the country. And uh, that was the Hinduism that was rooted in rituals and ceremonies. So it is the type of Hinduism which was rooted in Vedanta that Sri Aurobindo wanted to bring back. And why that was important was because this section, which was uh, the great mass of orthodox Hinduism, was more or less aloof, was more or less aloof to the freedom struggle. They didn't care for it. Uh, they didn't worry who was ruling them. Uh, they had gone into this sort of a sleep that they were quite happy to go on living in the type of life that they had been living for long. Even if it was poor and miserable, they had come to accept that this is our karma, this is our fate, and therefore we are happy with this poverty. And uh, uh, they were quite happy to just go on performing those few rituals and ceremonies which had remained from that ancient rich tradition. So in a sense, they were quite aloof to the freedom struggle, and that's why Sri Aurobindo says, which has hardly which was hardly ever touched by the old Congress movement. The old Congress movement could not reach them, could not touch them, because it didn't go to the heart of these people. It didn't touch the souls of these people. And therefore, they remained aloof from the freedom struggle. And who else remained aloof or indifferent? The great slumbering mass of Islam, which has remained politically inert. So they also were not touched. And then he's talking about the shopkeepers, the artisan class, and the immense body of illiterate and ignorant peasantry. Now, shopkeepers and artisan class, again, by and large, self-centered, so long as they are making some, doing some profitable business, they did not care who is ruling them. And uh, the illiterate and ignorant farmers, again, uh, they had not uh, received the type of education that uh, could have made them more uh, awake to the realities. The British had ensured that uh, this country, which had uh, a partshala in every village, uh, had become essentially illiterate. We had almost 100% literacy, even during the Mughal period. Because while the Mughals destroyed our higher education system, the school education system was still intact. And every village had a partshala where, apart from language and science, the children did study uh, also Ramayana and Mahabharat. That was still going on. It is the British who withdrew total support from it, squeezed it and starved the system so that it would die and replaced it with a system of education which could never strike roots in this country. And uh, therefore, uh, the illiterate and ignorant farmers, the submerged classes, and even the wild tribes and races, the tribal populations, still outside the pale of Hindu civilization. So all of them need to be involved, awakened, and brought into the fold of the freedom movement. That was Sri Aurobindo's nationalism. Nationalism can afford to neglect and omit none, none of these. So it was not an exclusive type of nationalism that the fact that it held a greater appeal for the Hindus was because they happened to be in the majority, but that was not the intention. Then you know, at one point, Sri Aurobindo said, nationalism is a religion that has come from God. Which means that uh, the freedom struggle of India was to him a divine intervention. A divine intervention which had been considered necessary by the divine because this country also had a role to play for the rest of the world. Because uh, there were so many countries which were uh, enslaved. Why is it that this freedom movement more or less started with India? Uh, why did the divine have to intervene that at least one big chunk of land, this Bharat, had to be emancipated from colonial rule? 
Why did the divine have to intervene? Because India had a role to play in the world and the divine is concerned with the world as a whole. And to understand this unique role that India can play for the world and uh, is playing in fact, we can now see it very clearly, can be understood a little better if we go into the history of uh, these two places, the ancient history of these people and I'll try to be as brief as possible while doing so. And I'll first go it into the European history. Now, if you look at the European history, its uh, heyday was, say, the Greek civilization, which was around 300 to 400 BC. Aristotle, Plato, and uh, in the world of medicine, Hippocrates, they all belong to that era. And what was their strong point? Intellectuality, rationality, intellectual excursions, philosophy, based on a intellectual approach to the deeper truths of existence, trying to arrive at the highest truth by an intellectual exercise. That was basically their strong point. But then uh, came the Romans, with which the decline started, and when the Roman Empire fell, Europe entered dark ages. And what replaced the intellect was conventions. Conventions which were imposed by Christianity. So essentially, the church started running the countries, and uh, church and religion being relatively dogmatic, it uh, just had interest in conventional and uh, conventional approach to life. The convention essentially means you keep doing what has been going on for hundreds, hundreds of years without questioning it. And that type of questioning was not permitted in their religion, and therefore Europe entered dark ages which lasted nearly 1,000 years. If and off and on there came some rebels who questioned these conventions, they were in such a minority that they were persecuted. But then the number of these uh, rationalists gradually grew and the result was the European Renaissance, which has been arbitrarily fixed by a few historians in the 16th century. And uh, the result of this was that the spirit of inquiry and the freedom of thought could once again breathe some fresh air. And the result of this was the development of modern science Science led to technology, technology led to industrialization and the industrial revolution that brought in prosperity to those parts of the world, uh, Western Europe particularly, and that in turn made it possible for them to colonize large chunks of the world. England and France was partic were particularly successful, the British Empire being uh, one which grew so much that uh, it used to be said that the sun never sets in the British Empire. So that's how they ended up colonizing the world. Now, what about India? Uh, India was uh, at its peak till about 2000 to 2500 years ago. And in that sense, we were at our peak when the Greek civilization was also at its peak in Europe around the same time, around 2500 years ago. But of course, our history went back at least another 2500 years, which means and the Vedic age is at least 5,000 years old, and now there are many evidences to show it was in fact much older, although the uh, recorded documents like the Vedas have been placed at about 5,000 years, but in fact the tradition goes much, is much older than that. And so for at least two, uh, two and a half thousand years, we had sustained productivity, but in which area? Primarily in the area of spiritual wisdom. So while the uh, European civilization at its peak during the Greek period was basically an intellectual civilization. We were a spiritual civilization at the, around the same time. And uh, they entered the Dark Ages because of uh, the type of influence, because of the attitude that the Romans had to the civilization and later the emergence of Christianity and so on. But then we also entered our Dark Ages. But then it was not really very visible. And one of the factors which might have contributed to our dark ages was mere exhaustion. Just as individuals get exhausted, societies also get exhausted. Nowhere in the world you'll find any example of more than 3,000 years of sustained productivity in the spiritual field and it's finding a place in every ordinary person's life. Nowhere else will you find such an example. But that's what India had been doing for about 3,000 years till about 2,000 years ago when that decline started. But then the momentum built up was such 
that this decline was not felt till about a thousand years ago. Till about a thousand years ago, India was second to none in terms of uh, arts, literature, music, dance, drama, and even science and technology. In fact, the very word navigation comes from now. We were the leaders in navigation. And it is said that uh, Vasco da Gama depended upon Indian sailors to uh, uh, travel west. So we were ahead of the rest of the world in every field till about a thousand years ago. But then uh, once the degeneration had set in, came in that dichotomy between worldly life and spiritual life. And uh, that way India lost its core that the masses were divorced from their core strength and that is what led to a degeneration of worldly life. That is what made enslavement possible and that is that brought in further decline. So during that decline, during our dark ages, which started about a thousand years ago, uh, we became very conventional in our approach. And Shirobindo says that in his, the, in his major work, The Human Cycle, that every society goes through this cycle of uh, uh, going through an age of convention and then emergence of the age of reason. And uh, that happens because some people will continue to be born, will continue to question the conventions which don't make sense, and they would like to have a more rational approach to life. That's what brought in European Renaissance. But uh, in India, that did not happen because of slavery. Only now we are making those shuffling steps towards the age of reason. But then what was the result of Europe entering the age of reason about uh, 400 years ago? Not only science, technology and industry, but also a great reliance on the same instruments for wiping out the problems of human existence. The instrument that had helped the growth of science and technology, that is rationality, was pressed into service for solving the problems of human existence. And what are those problems? The problems are basically inequality, injustice, cruelty, misery, and suffering. Now, it was thought that now all these problems will be wiped out. Now that we have science and technology, and we have that major tool rationality, we can wipe out all these problems. But it did not happen. Not only science and technology did not do it, when the same instrument of rationality was pressed into service, to come up with systems of education and systems of government, even that did not work. Look at two contrasting systems of government which came up during that period when the hopes had been given up that science and technology and industry alone will be able to do it. And uh, what were these two systems? Communism and uh, democracy. Both very rational, both very well intentioned. Who can have an argument with, uh, say, communism from each according to his capacity to each according to his needs? You can't have any quarrel with that hmm? to achieve equality. And uh, who can have a quarrel with everybody being equal, everybody having a vote and therefore being able to elect a government, whatever the majority of people want, that those people govern them for a limited period of time and if they don't do well, they fight the election again and if they have not done well, they lose. Nobody can have any quarrel, very well intentioned. So the people who have been elected by the people will naturally work for the inter interest of the people. And uh, then came up that slogan of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And uh, Sherbindo says that slogan is ideal, but then unrealistic at the present level of human consciousness. Why? Because uh, democracy tried to give some liberties to people but then, because of that, it was exactly because of that it could not achieve equality. And uh, communism tried to impose some sort of an equality, some semblance of equality, but that they could do only by taking away liberties. And therefore, you cannot have both liberty and equality simultaneously at the present level of consciousness. The key to that achieving both liberty and equality is fraternity, brotherhood a sense of universal brotherhood and sisterhood based on the fact that we are all one. And what is it that gives us that feeling of oneness? Spirituality. Because only at the spiritual level that we can realize this, that we are all one. And uh, that is how spirituality becomes relevant. So he said it is this sense of oneness which genuinely gives us that psychological product in the form of uh, universal brotherhood and sisterhood 
which will lead to both liberty and equality. Because if everybody is my brother or sister, then I can't keep myself free and keep my brothers and sisters in chains. Or if uh, I am well fed, I can't keep my brothers and sisters starved. So both liberty and equality will be achieved if there is fraternity. And fraternity cannot come without that spiritual touch. And that is where, and therefore, he said that all these approaches based on rationality, like communism and democracy and so on, are destined to fail. Why would they fail? Because although they are rational and they are well intentioned, when they'll be implemented by people at the ordinary level of consciousness, then there will always be some in any society, irrespective of the system of government, who will be more powerful, who will be more wealthy, or who will be more intelligent, who will be more hardworking. And these people, particularly those who are ruling these, ruling the people, they'll be able to corner more of the resources for themselves, and they'll also be able to justify it. You know, the way the pigs did in uh, uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. The, in that animal society, the pigs were made the leaders because they thought they are the most intelligent. And gradually, and the society was based on that same type of equality which communism has, and the pigs gradually started saying that we have such a re great responsibility, we have so many important decisions to take, so we deserve a little more comfortable life. And in that process, they started cornering more and more comforts for themselves. And that is exactly what happened in communist countries also. There was a time when the president of the USSR was living in greater luxury than the president of the United States. So, in fact, that's exactly what happened. So, while I mean they started with the idea of equality, they could not even maintain that equality, and of course, the liberties had been taken away. So, Shurabindo says that when all these things fail, even the finest product of this rationality was rationalistic humanism. He said that that is also destined to fail. And why would that also fail? Again, because so long as the present level of human consciousness continues, any of these approaches is bound to fail. And when all the approaches based on rationality fail, then for solving the problems of human existence, whom will the West look up to? Something which is higher than reason, something that is beyond reason. And where will they find it? In ancient Indian spiritual wisdom. So that is what uh, made it very necessary that after this experimentation with all these approaches based on rationalities would be exhausted in the late 19th or early 20th century, that was the time when Sri was around and could see clearly that that is the time when the West will start looking up to India. And of course, in the divine scheme, the divine had already seen it. And that is why this divine intervention to make India free so that it could supply that wisdom to the rest of the world. And uh, that is what made the West very receptive to ancient Indian wisdom. And in a way, the landmark in this, which showed that the world was, the Western world was truly becoming receptive to ancient Indian wisdom, was the way Swami Vivekananda's address was received in 1893 in Chicago at the Parliament of Religions. That was a sort of a landmark. Although, I mean, India becoming a Vishwaguru is a process, it's not an event. Getting freedom on the Independence Day can be an event, but the India becoming a Vishwaguru is not an event, it's a process. And But if we have to look at a milestone in that process, 1893 was a milestone, and uh, in a way 1893 seems to be a very important year in the spiritual history of the world. That was the year in which uh, uh, Swami, Vekananda, Swami Vekananda delivered the famous uh, address at the Parliament of Religious in Chicago. That was the year in which Sri returned to India from England. And that was the year in which Swami Yogananda Paramansa was born. So three important events happened in the same year, 1893. And each one of them had a role to play in providing the West ancient Indian wisdom in the form in which they could receive it. Swami Vekananda, Sri Aurobindo, Swami Vekananda went to uh, the West, Sri Aurobindo did not go to the West, but his influence spread because the receptivity was high. And Swami Yogananda Paramansa again went. So alternately they kept, one went, the other didn't go, the other again went. So you know, alternating to actually go to the West. So that kept happening and that process is still continuing with many living gurus now. 
So that process of uh, supplying ancient Indian spiritual wisdom to the West succeeded because the West was receptive and the West was receptive because they had exhausted the possibilities of reason and found that reason does not work and therefore they were highly receptive to it. And that is why the world needed it. And therefore, for being able to play this role, India had to be free. And what is the larger sort of uh, message or mission behind this? The mission is not only to supply uh, ancient Indian wisdom to the West so that uh, the uh, problems of human existence can be solved. Just by getting that wisdom, they will not be solved, in fact. They will be solved when that wisdom is put into practice. And when, how, will that, how is that wisdom put into practice? By living a life which is more in keeping with that wisdom. And what does that lead to? That leads to a rise in consciousness. And what does that mean? Essentially, the consciousness, instead of being uh, ego-driven, becomes love-driven. And what is the character of that love-driven consciousness? That it can see more clearly and bring into life more visibly the type of the pattern of life which uh, is uh, based on a sense of oneness. Because love, oneness and intimacy, they go together. Whom are the people whom we are the closest to? Whom are the people whom we love? Who we feel are more like us? They look like us, they speak the same language, they uh, dress like us, and so on and so forth. So no, they think like us. So this sense of similarity or oneness is what leads to intimacy and love. Now, while I mean there are many differences between uh, people, we are a diverse race, the human race is diverse, at a certain fundamental deepest level we are all one. And what is that level? That is the spiritual level. Because uh, in one way we can say that we are all manifestations or visible manifestations in a visible form of the same God. A simpler way to put it is we are all children of the same God. But look at it in any way, the, since our source is the same, the divine essence is the same, we have a certain fundamental oneness. And when that oneness is recognized, that is what leads to that rise in consciousness, which is love-driven. That is what leads to fraternity. And that is what will change the world. That is what will wipe out the problems of human existence. So in fact, the larger sort of mission in the divine scheme seems to be that uh, the West, which had not, which had started with an intellectual civilization, then even that was taken away and uh, banished and uh, it became a conventional society and then reason was brought in again and led to all this development in science and technology. Now that uh, part of the world is becoming ready for an approach which goes beyond reason and here is a source available so that has to be provided so that that part of the world also starts participating in this rise in consciousness. And of course India also uh, has to do the same and that's why India was being woken up. India has to go through the same process. Doesn't mean that we'll take 400 years to do so. We can do it much faster because it is in our blood. But all the same, essentially the process has to be the same and uh, we also have to bring spirituality into our everyday life, live a life which is based on that, those deeper truths of existence and that is what will uh, truly lift the consciousness of the world. Doesn't mean that uh, the entire population of the world will be affected by it. What is important is that a large number should be affected. The numbers are important. When the numbers are enough to be able to influence the affairs of the world, and then the world will change. So the spectrum of consciousness is wide today and probably will continue to be wide. But then what matters is the average level of consciousness. And the average depends upon the numbers. As the numbers multiply, the average will rise, and then that will become the dominant force, the dominant type of consciousness, the dominant power that will run the world and that is what will change the world and make it a better place to live in. So in a way we can say that uh, uh, India's freedom will enable, uh, the way Sri Aurobindo uh, saw it was, that India's freedom will enable India to play a better role or play its role better in the rest of the world. That in turn will lead to a sense of oneness in the human race, that's human unity. That's why you know, the twin work of that human cycle is the ideal of human unity. 
and uh, this will depend in turn on what one may call one may call the project consciousness that is a project of lifting up the consciousness of the human race so india's political freedom to shorobindo was not actually truly speaking the goal it was uh, you can say a milestone perhaps a better word would be to say it was a stepping stone and even better it was the springboard so india's political freedom to shorobindo was the springboard from which the world could take a plunge a plunge into the pool of consciousness so that the human race could swim to the safety and security and peace of a soulful existence so that is what freedom of the country meant to shorobindo now one might say that for all that why was uh, the freedom of the country still necessary one can still question it india could export that wisdom even without being free so i wake and i did it much before the country became free so one could have continued that process but all the same it does make a difference because uh, even if the world needs something large numbers masses will accept it more easily from a country which is free uh, uh, in my school uh, our principal who also taught us english in class 11 mr lal he had a diploma in teaching from england and uh, so he would have gone to england sometime in the 1930s to get that diploma in teaching and uh, he said that when he was in london and uh, he was living in a house you know the, it's common practice to uh, live in a uh, house where you have a landlady you know because they gave away part of the later uh, gave, gave away part of the house on rent to students uh, to make some money but then they become the student becomes more or less a part of the family so once he said the conversation turned to music and she was talking about western music and when i told her that we also have great indian music great music in india oh yes i know you have that tom tom thought of music no that was the image we had in the common man that some sort of a primitive tom tom sort of music huh? and you saw what type of music we have when one of the people was singing and uh, we have many other accomplished musicians here so that was the image we had and how could that image be corrected well, the first step in that is that the country has to be free not only the country has to be free the country has to be strong and the country has to be wealthy its economy has to be good and today india has all these three and that is why today in the world india counts and that is why even our spiritual wisdom is be received being received so well our music art dance drama everything is being received very well all over the world so anyone who gets accomplished in any of these areas and in all these areas we have spirituality entering because spirituality permeates all aspect of our lives be it music or dance or drama all these people in different ways are taking this spiritual approach to the rest of the world and they are being received so well because india today is a free country without that being free we could not have been strong and without being strong and free we could not have been a strong economy so it's because they are going where be it the spiritual leaders or be it uh, musicians or dancers they are going from a country which is free and strong in every way including economically and that is why th all this wisdom is being received so well i can end this with uh, another quote uh, from this book which is uh, about sure what shorobindo told the students of national college bengal national college in kolkata which had been established with the idea of bringing in a national system of education once he was addressing the students of that college and this is what he told them there are times in a nation's history when providence places before it one work one aim to which everything else however high and noble in itself has to be sacrificed such a time has now arrived for our motherland when nothing is dearer than her service when everything else is to be directed to that end if you will study study for her sake train your self body and mind and soul for her service you will earn your living that you may live for her sake you will go abroad to foreign lands that you may bring back knowledge with which you may do service to her now here shorobindo is talking about the freedom struggle he is trying to 
inspire the youth to join the freedom struggle. This is the time when the most important thing that you have to do is to serve the motherland. And serving the motherland meant working for the emancipation of the country from foreign rule. Well, that came in 1947. That was an event. But then emancipation of India did not mean only emancipation from the foreign rule. It meant also emancipation from dead habit and convention. And uh, it meant emancipation from confining our spiritual practices to rituals and ceremonies. It meant all these things. These are not an event like the gaining the independence. These are a process. And therefore, if one was to just sort of interpret service in a different way, this passage is extremely relevant even today. Service to the motherland is just as important today as it was in 1907 when the National College was established. For 1906 or 1907, it's 1906, I think, the National College was established. So it is just as relevant today as it was then. And uh, the message, if one were to see it in terms of a message of Sri Aurobindo, uh, to the nation, particularly to the youth of the nation, would still remain the same, that this is the time when what matters the most is service to the motherland. Doesn't mean that you don't do anything else. I said, if you study, study with the idea that you have to serve the motherland. If you uh, earn a, make a living, do that with that idea that uh, that is only a means to an end. The end is service to the motherland. And uh, if you go abroad, bring back that knowledge so that you can serve the motherland better. Now, the, all that applies even today. And how can the motherland be served? By continuing that process of emancipation which Yorubindo initiated. And uh, that's a process. And that is what will make us not only make this nation truly great, make once again spirituality permeate every aspect of Indian life, but will also make us a more worthy uh, source of spiritual wisdom to the rest of the world. Because the wisdom we can export, but uh, a country which also lives that wisdom gets a moral right to export that wisdom. It benefits from that wisdom. And that is a process which should continue. And uh, that is something which we can learn from what Sri Aurobindo uh, had in mind when he talked about spiritual nationalism and uh, when he talked about nationalism merging with internationalism. The question that has been asked is, uh, uh, now Indian spiritual wisdom is spreading all over the world. What prevented it from spreading two and a half thousand years ago or even earlier? Uh, probably every region in the world has had its strong points. Eventually they have to merge, but I think uh, uh, for some strange reason there seems to be a strong point in every region. And the uh, Western world was probably more geared to intellectual effort and the East more to the life of the spirit, particularly India. And uh, that's why if you look at the major religions of the world, all major religions of the world uh, took birth in the East. And uh, that did not prevent science and technology from developing, but the strong point of the East was also is this. Uh, one can't say that actually it prevented it altogether because there has been to and fro uh, exchange between uh, India and China, India and the West, even in those days. But probably what uh, has contributed to a f greater possibility of dissemination now is once again modern science and technology. Because uh, uh, if you look at it sort of the, in the larger scheme of things, if the divine scheme is for this world is that uh, the consciousness of the human race should change and uh, that is the destiny of this planet, then even what human beings have been doing as uh, without being conscious of it, without intending to do so, has been contributing to that process. So science and technology contributed to it by making dissemination easier. 
and the, what, the way it has done it in the last 50 years has been more than what it did in the preceding 400 years. That also we can see with the growth of the uh, internet and all that. And uh, then not only that, there are further developments on the way on which there was a conference recently in Mangalore to which Aditi went, <laughs> uh, which was on uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, how they are going to influence the world. And uh, one can see that uh, even those developments possibly would contribute to the same process. The same process of uh, involve, engulfing the whole world in a process which will uh, lead to a further growth of science and technology, a f further growth of consciousness of the human race. And to just give you one or two examples uh, of uh, how this might happen. One is that uh, as we have moved to uh, a level of technology which was passive, say at the level of the television, now at the level of uh, the games and smartphones, that technology does not require the user to be only passive, it has made the uh, person more interactive. And greater interaction means again a stimulation uh, to the uh, stimulus for the mind, and therefore the children today uh, are not at least being passive receivers of something which anybody else has created. They are not passive about it. Whether we use it for the good or bad, that is up to us. I mean, same technology we can use constructively or for destruction. Another example, uh, if there's any crime anywhere, then quickly somebody makes a video out of it. Everybody seems to have the technology available in his pocket for making a video. And the result is that uh, uh, you have evidence, evidence created without the criminal realizing it. He didn't even think that this may happen, but it happens. So many things which are being hushed up earlier can't be hushed up anymore. Not only the evidence is created, that evidence spreads all over the world with great rapidity. Again, because of modern science and technology. And when that happens, there's a reaction to it. And what is the ultimate product of that reaction? Uh, a rise in consciousness. Because less and less people will start doing the type of things which this criminal did, and they'll start realizing that this is not the right thing to do, something else. So, that is how the consciousness will rise. So, the re so it seems that uh, all the developments are moving in a direction that uh, if, uh, in spite of all the mistakes that we make and use this technology for wrong reasons, in wrong ways, in spite of that, the ultimate uh, impact would be as the divine intent. So, as they say, you know, the human wills can clash. The mother has said, you know, some in the prayers and meditation, human wills may clash, but eventually the divine will prevails. So, there may be clashing human wills in terms of how this technology is used, but ultimately the divine will will prevail. A small amount of positivity can overcome a much larger amount of negativity. And that's how the divine will will prevail, and all these developments will also end up contributing to that larger divine scheme of, uh, uh, of um, raising the consciousness of the human race and uh, in Shirobindo's language, heaven will be brought down to earth. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the question is uh, that, uh, uh, the, that religion and uh, spirituality uh, have also created divisions. Now this is because of the confusion between religion and spirituality. Religions, the overall influence of religions has also been positive. But uh, certainly they have also created divisions and conflicts. But uh, in spirituality, there's no conflict because spirituality is more within than outside. Broadly speaking, every religion has four aspects. One is its underlying spiritual philosophy. And uh, with respect to that, all religions are almost the same. In the sense, all religions have almost the same underlying spiritual philosophy. And whatever little differences are there, they can be easily reconciled. The second important uh, component of every religion is an ethical code. In that, there are differences, but uh, in spirituality, there is no such rigid ethical code and therefore there is no conflict. Why there is no, you can say, does it mean that in spirituality you can do whatever you want? No. In spirituality, the ethical code is based on your own inner sort of voice, the voice of the divine essence, the soul, which Shurabindu, the mother, called the psychic being. So it is on that that the ethics is based. And that is uh, 
a level higher than a written ethical code, any written ethical code, because it has universal validity at all times, all places, and it provides situation-specific and individual-specific guidance at the moment very quickly and clearly. The only thing is we have to pay heed to it. So that is the type of ethical code which spirituality has, which does not come in conflict with any other ethical code, but at the same time goes beyond every other ethical code. The third component of any religion are the rituals and ceremonies associated with it, and the fourth are the myths and legends. Now it's these rituals and ceremonies and myths and legends which give an identity to a religion. They are the outer aspects of the religion, the external and more visible aspects of the religion, and least important, but given maximum importance sometimes, and that is what leads to conflicts. So the conflicts are, will go as we move away from religions towards spirituality, and that is also one of part of the vision of Sri Aurobindo, that the world as a whole will move away from religions towards spirituality. And that is also taking shape, and because of the greater receptivity in the West, this movement is also much more visible in the West than in India. And uh, what is the evidence? The evidence is uh, uh, an issue of the Time magazine, I think which was around 2012 or something, you know, every year in the Time magazine, they have one issue dedicated to 10 ideas that are changing the world. In that issue, which was, I think, around 10 years ago, they said that one of those 10 ideas, which is changing the world, is the growth of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, nuns. What, who are these nuns? Nuns are people who say that uh, we have no affiliation with any organized religion, but we are spiritual. This is the largest going, growing population in the world today in the West. So many young people, an ever increasing number of young people openly tell the census officer, if he goes and asks them, what is your religion? They say, I have no religion, but I am spiritual. That is the fastest growing movement in the world today, in the Western world. Exhaustion was probably one of the factors, but uh, there could be other reasons also. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, led to this was uh, the idea that uh, the divine is real, whereas the world is an illusion. Hmm? The world is an illusion. Now, illusion is true. Illusion is what? That the appearance is different from the reality. Yes, the appearance is that I see this table, I see all of you individually, I see plants and animals and so on. That is the appearance. But uh, that is not the deepest reality of all these things. The deepest reality is the divine. So in that sense, the appearance is different from the reality and therefore the world is an illusion. But then it was misinterpreted. The interpretation given was uh, that the world is a falsehood. And since it is a falsehood, we need not take any interest in it. Those of us who are obliged to take interest in it because of various obligations and compulsions and responsibilities are just wasting their time, but at the same time we have no choice. Lucky are those who are able to renounce this world, go away to the Himalayas or to a cave and pursue what is real. So they are pursuing the reality, we are lost in an unreal world, uh, a world of falsehood which has no value. What we forgot was that this un uh, apparently unreal world also is a manifestation of the divine. It is another form of the divine. So you cannot accept one form of the divine that is the invisible and the unmanifest and reject the other form that is visible just because it happens to be temporary. Yes, it is a temporary reality. It is a partial reality, but at the same time, at the core of it, is the same invisible reality which we are accepting as real. So the form that it has taken, just because it is temporary, we can't reject it. So this is something which we forgot. So in fact, not only it is uh, real, but in fact it is what has been given to us as a vehicle so that we can fulfill the purpose of human life, so that we can uh, realize that ultimate reality better. It's not by just running away from the world and going to the Himalayas that we can do it. It can be done also while engaging with the world, engaging without getting attached and involved. Love without attachment would be the key to this process. So love this world, but do not get attached to it. So that is what that illusion should make us conscious of. So to give a very simple example, if you have a number of pots of clay, uh, the deepest reality of all those pots is the clay of which they are made. But all the same, while the pots last, they are also real. You can't say that the pots are unreal just because they will break one day and will turn into clay. 